your practice in an academic, uh, like the Cleveland Clinic, we will all be affected and it's a very important subject that we should know about. Um, our first panelist will be uh, Dr. Will Harrell. He's past president and CEO of Carolina ENT and Sinus and Allergy Center. He's a clinical associate professor in the Department of Otolaryngology at UNC School of Medicine and Wake Forest Baptist Health. Um, he's a member of the Academy's 3P Committee, which is the Physician Payment and Policy Committee. Very important, especially when we're dealing with reimbursements of our various procedures um, and the codes that we submit. He's co-founder and co-chair of the North Carolina Otolaryngology Health Af Policy Advisory Committee and co-founder of Bridgepoint MD, a multi-specialty value-based clinically integrated network providing specialists with a platform to engage ACOs and employers with alternative payment models and value-based contracting. We also have Dr. Chip Woodard, who's an associate professor um, in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at Duke University Health System. He's chief of the Division of Facial Plastics and Reconstructive Surgery, chief of the Division of Comprehensive Otolaryngology, and the, the director of their otolaryngology residency program. He's co-founder and co-chair of the North Carolina Otolaryngology uh, Health Policy Advisory Committee. Um, last, we have Jim Guerra. He's co-founder of Fusion 5, serving as its CEO from 2017 to 2022, co-founder of Bridgeport MD and CEO of Harmonic Health. Thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. We're very excited to learn about this subject and I'll just pass it on to you. Thank you, Troy. And we appreciate the opportunity to give a presentation on what is becoming a topic that's kind of coming uh, out of the ether and, and beginning to kind of consolidate on all of our plates. Uh, Value-based healthcare is a real process. It's something that has developed primarily within primary care over the past 12 years. And CMS and uh, other entities have decided it's time for the specialists to get involved. So our uh, message here is uh, be aware of what's coming and let's learn about how to engage it. We have no ACCME commercial interest to disclose. And it's awful early. This is a very complex topic, and I want to make sure that uh, we kind of let you all know what we're, what we're going to talk about and also go ahead and give you the conclusions up front. So our objective here is to understand the basics of value-based health care and how this is driving health care payment reform. Review specialist value-based payment integration timelines and reimbursement models. We want to discuss the strategic approaches that specifically otolaryngology should consider as we build out our value-based data strategies for engagement in future alternative payment models. And again, it's early, very complicated topic, so let's just start with the conclusion of all this. The payment pie is fixed. There is no more money coming for specialists within these payer budgets, especially within CMS. So you can spend this money as you would like within your commercial practice, but you are being judged on your cost and quality footprint for the ICD-10 condition-based episodes you are treating. You will be paid differently in the future, and you are currently being valued differently. And this will impact not only your salary, but can also impact the stability of your group practice. And finally, payers and primary care will avoid sending you referrals if you cost them shared savings compared to your peers. This is not managed care. This is a different form of payment system, and the primary care doctors are, are reimbursed for efficiently taking care of these patients. So we got to kind of put everything in context. Healthier spending is an enormous part of our government uh, and country GDP. Um, we almost capped out at 20%, a little bit of a dip, after COVID, but healthcare spending represents $4.3 trillion in 2021, and, and we have now hit inflation within this process. So what is driving value-based payment reform? Well, you've got to look at, well, who has the most risk? And so if you look at payment enrollment duration liability risk, we call this peddler. Uh, it, it shows here that Medicare clearly carries the most risk through both traditional Medicare and then stacking on Medicare Advantage. Medicare pays $2.3 billion in claims per day. They are the largest healthcare payer 
in the United States, and they're the ones driving this process. Well, that's a problem because the Medicare trust fund is becoming insolvent. Now, people would say, well, we've been saying this for years. Well, yes, but Congress has been putting money into the system to prevent this from happening, and that's not being something that's being discussed presently. So here's a line of how the Medicare trust fund within this current spending is going down to insolvency. And it affects hospitals right off the bat because Part A insurance trust fund is going to be uh, near zero by 2030. So this is the payment pie that shows where the dollars are going, all 4.3 trillion that Will previously mentioned. Also important to re-emphasize that is 20% of GDP. So it's an unsustainable increase. And we've heard that for a long time. We really have reached the breaking point now with all of the effort in CMS and CMMI to change how payment is done. And as we know, historically, when CMS makes major changes, private payers follow, follow suit. I think what's important to point out here is the small piece that's physician services. You'll see that represents 14.4% of what you see in that pie. The important point here is that the majority of medical decisions that are made that lead to that 4.3 trillion cost are in our hands. It's our decisions, it's our orders, it's how we practice medicine that drives the majority of this cost. So we have a lot to do with how payment policy should be formed in the future, and we have to take our role and responsibility in that. Next slide. So the paradox of healthcare is that the United States has the providers, science, drugs, diagnostics, and devices needed for outstanding care. Where we fall short is in delivery of that care, resulting in a sicker population, episodic care, and expenses that are far greater than necessary. Next slide. So this leads to a zero sum competition in healthcare where really what is occurring is cost shifting that instead of fundamental cost reduction. So cost shift from the payer to the patient, the health plan to the hospital, the hospital to the physician, and therefore there's no net change in value. Gains for one participant come at the expense of another. And consolidation that occurs in healthcare in the name of efficiency is really uh, driven toward control. It's to increase bargaining power and capture patients, restrict choice for those patients. And as the system's currently designed, that's how money is made. We all know about prior authorization. It's the break that insurance companies press when costs start to get out of control. Next slide. So these are the transformational principles that we are proposing. And, and much of this information comes in part out of Porter and Teesberg's work in 2006 in a book called Redefining Healthcare, Creating Value-Based Competitions on Results. So again, this, this book was written or published 17 years ago and still has a significant amount of application today. We've taken some of those principles, updated them and applied them in the slide you see here, where we state that these are the important things that we should focus on as we look to drive policy and payment in future healthcare delivery. So the focal stakeholder is the patient and the return on investment that we must create is value in that relationship. And that value needs to occur across the full cycle of care, not episodic care where we come in, provide a service and then remove ourselves from care of the patient, but part of a care team that provides care for a specific disease process and does so in a cost-effective manner. That requires coordination and collaboration uh, amongst many different specialties to be able to effectively deliver that care. To be able to do so, we need some competency in value-based payment. It's completely different than what we're used to currently. And we need to remove our silos and protectionist barriers that affect our ability to deliver that care. This should lead to transparency and price and outcomes for patients and removing those administrative burdens so that we can practice that care efficiently and effectively. Next slide. So it's important that we all speak the same language. And in here, there's information regarding how we think about value-based payment. Fee-for-service is really, really easy to understand. Uh, the more I do, the more I get paid. The problem is that's a race to the bottom. As we've shown in prior slides and data, we've got health healthcare costs that are out of control and patient satisfaction that does not correspond with the cost of delivery of the care in our current environment. 
So we need to move to a, a model that doesn't reward folks for volume, but rather the value they provide and patient care. And there are many different models that have been uh, proposed over time. And then when MACRA came out in 2015, so that was the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, they put in uh, the, these comments regarding the importance of value over volume and created MIPS. MIPS was sort of the first shot at trying to define value. Admittedly, it was clunky and it was a one size fits all that didn't make a whole lot of sense when you looked at it at an individual provider level and actually providing true value. Um, there have been many improvements since that time and we will talk about some of those today. Pay for performance was sort of the, the, the new redesign of how value was being delivered. The problem there was that it penalized providers that cared for a sicker population of patients. And so being able to uh, identify who those patients are on the front end and then record them in a way that does not penalize a provider for providing that care, as we see in many academic medical centers, is an important part of moving forward and CMS and CMI recognize that. Uh, and it's important that we also, as I mentioned before, provide care over the entire episode of care for a patient and not episodic in nature where we take care of one part but are not communicating and collaborating with others for the rest of the care of that disease process. Next slide. Bundled payments. Uh, this is probably uh, most effective and successful in the orthopedic environment where a price is paid for, let's say a knee replacement and it's paid on the front end. If you save money, you get to keep a portion of that money. If you don't, then the cost, you, you bear the cost or additional cost that, it, uh, that was uh, in providing care for that patient. Shared savings is a, is a uh, more global opportunity for you to be able to participate in payment uh, programs such as bundle payments where there's an opportunity for you to have collection of additional revenue if you provide a savings and care for that uh, patient. Uh, to date, many of those programs have been upside only, so there's a, a bonus for those uh, groups that participate in these programs. Moving forward, it'll be bidirectional, so there's downside risk associated with um, caring for populations of patients if you're not able to do so in a cost-effective way. And then if we move from fee-for-service all the way over to the other end of the spectrum, instead of linking um, cost to specific patients' diagnosis and care they're receiving on the front end, you receive a per-member, per-month payment for care of a population of patients, what, what that payers, uh, patient population is. And if the care of that population costs less than it is anticipated, you again receive additional funding as a result of saving, uh, saving money. The argument um, against some of those types of programs has been, or the criticism has been, well, if you save money in this particular fiscal year, next year does that number reset to the new savings value, therefore driving down costs so far that eventually you're gonna have an individual level cost. And CMMI has de designed programs and or uh, has designed pathways in which that does not occur, that can occur because that's not a successful way to deliver value-based care. Next slide. So CHIP is, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm good, I'm good. Okay, go so CHIP has described the language of value-based care and so let's go through the models and so we all are familiar with the traditional model that's category one which is a fee for service there's no link to quality you're paid for what you do and value is not even recorded in in that process pay for performance that is something we've had a little exposure to through mips and mvp but our engagement of this process has not been effective at all uh, we really are not making a difference in the value of the patient's care and we are not making a difference in the cost but that's what mips and mvp was was sort of our introduction while the rest of this got built out but category two is a fee for service linked to quality and value uh, the next step which is really the, the the true alternative payments is when you either have a category three which is where you have fee for service and you're given alternative payments on top of that when you when you create savings or produce defined value that impacts the savings of healthcare. Finally, the last part is category four. This is full-fledged, upside-downside, 
alternative payments with no fee for service in it, uh, population based payments. And what I want the message to be clearly heard is that CMS has a goal to move to 100% alternative payments by 2030. Now, they won't make that goal, but it doesn't matter. There's going to be a critical impact in terms of the implementation and rollout where once they hit a certain percentage of 50 or 40 or 60%, it's basically something you're going to have to deal with. So where are we in the current rollout adoption? Well, in 2021, you'll see here that on average, alternative payments being category 3A, which is upside only risk, 3B, upside downside, both backed with fee for service, and category four is full fledged alternative payments with no fee for service, we're looking at about 40%, with the most integration being in Medicare Advantage and traditional Medicare, with the commercial carriers following well behind. So, again, the way this process breaks down, the goal is to get to 100% of, of alternative payments within Medicare. And I think what the point of this slide is, is that when they're moving forward and, and building the roadway, the commercial carrier and Medicaid will follow along. So we're not going to be able to just put our head in the sand. It is the priority of CMS through their innovation center to get specialists involved in ACOs, which is the alternative payment platform that was established through both the Affordable Care Act and MACRA. And there are barriers to this because the ACO model and design elements are really designed for primary care out of the gate. There are financial challenges to transitioning to accountable care. It can be costly. There's risk involved because the financial payments for accountable care is not like the fee for service, which comes in monthly. There's a period of time in which you have to collect the data to determine who gets paid. So there's a less linear cash flow that has to be dealt with. There's cultural changes. Who's accountable for this care? Uh, when you're referred a patient, are you responsible for care that you're not delivering after you've made a referral? What, what is the competition that needs to exist within this process? Because we all compete within fee for service. We know those rules. These, this new set of rule sets is very unnerving and scary because we are competing with each other, but we're, we already were to begin with in value-based care. But again, these rules and outcomes for measuring outcomes are all changing. The biggest challenge for specialists is that two-thirds of physicians are specialists. And within those two-thirds, there are at least 27 specialties before you even get to the divisions of subspecialties. When value-based care rolled out, this was a primary care Medicare platform. So it was one group of internists and primary care uh, physicians following the rules and integrating this process. So everyone was doing the same thing. And the biggest barrier is finding the data that fits within all this fragmented system. And more importantly, how do you find the scale to be able to have the data to be able to effectively contract and compete within value-based care? And so those are the barriers that CMS is trying to address. Who is going to deliver the pathway for specialists? And one of the thought processes is that they will just turn this over to ACOs and ACOs will handle our engagement. And our message today is that's not going to work well for specialists. We have our own interests within a contractual relationship within alternative payments. And we need to find a way to make the scale within our institutions and our group practices to be able to effectively engage this model. So CMS is looking at enhancing specialty care data transparency. Well, let me translate that. There's a little bit of government speak in here. They're going to give your performance data to primary care so they know who should get the referral and who should not based on these new metrics. They're going to be they're trying to maintain growth in the acute episode payment models and condition based models. But what does that mean? Well, they have some through the innovation center bundle payment programs, nephrology programs, oncology being medical oncology programs. There's no otolaryngology program yet. But they're working on rolling out new models. And in 2026, we might get a chance to put our feet in the water and, and have a value-based payment model that we can participate in. Right now, we do not. 
but we still need to be preparing for it. They're creating financial incentives within primary care for specialist engagement. They're creating this within primary care. No one is talking to specialists. That's another problem. So who is going to basically be the steward of getting us involved? And they are creating some specialist incentives to affiliate with population-based models to move to primary care. And that's through these innovation platforms through CMMI, the Center for Innovation, with bundle payment, and of course the nephrology and oncology models. So what we're describing here is an entire new payment infrastructure that was launched in 2010, ratified and, and boosted in 2015 with, uh, with major legislation. It is being built around otolaryngology, which is just existing in its current fee-for-service platform. There's another world growing around us, and it's within the ACO growth. Now, what you'll see is there was a steep growth in ACOs flattened out during COVID. CMS has recognized this, and they are working to reestablish the growth of ACO involvement for their Medicare population, and we're going to have to be dealing with this whether we want to or not. So let's just kind of pause and let's review before we go diving in deeper what this process is. Well, we know the baseline in terms of what the value is being delivered over the timeline. It was fee-for-service, volume-based, no link to quality. Phase one, as we described, was primary care driven between primary care and payers beginning in 2010 with the development of the concept of population health, ACOs, and medical homes inside of primary care that guide the care of these patients. Looking at longitudinal payment reforms, where you're basically being paid to take care of the patient over a longer period of time, and more importantly, the, in the injection of bidirectional risk, which is you make money if you save money, and you owe money if you don't. And that's the accountable care process. We're now entering in phase two, which is the specialist side, where our performance data is going to be made transparent. There's going to be specialty claims-based data comparisons. It's already being banked, and all they have to do is decide to put it on the table for people to look at. Patient reported outcomes measures are not reported in claims, but CMS is actively working through HL7 and the FHIR uh, EMR uh, um, interoperability process to make patient-reported outcomes move forward, but patient-reported outcomes that only show a reduction of care costs are all that's going to matter moving forward. So these are value, uh, there will be value-driven referrals. This is not about just being available and being liked. It's about what you do for that cost of that patient once the referral hits. We've talked about the 2030 goal for 100% CMS reimbursement within alternative payments. And we're going to begin finding some experience to these uh, payment models, uh, which are going to be similar to the BPCI, the kidney care program, and enhancing oncology model. This is basically a high-performance specialist network. And where all this is going is to create a value-based ecosystem with primary care specialists, payers, and employers all working together as a, as a value-based healthcare collaborative to be able to provide accountable care and control costs more efficiently. So the model for value-based care, we talk about longitudinal care. Well, that's on the top line here within a population-based model. Primary care is doing preventative care, chronic care management and coordination. And then they engage hospitals, specialists, and, and there's another superset of primary care, which is the advanced primary care uh, provider who's taking care of the more intensive disease management. And we'll just say that would be like uh, a pediatrician or uh, an internist that is involved in the more advanced stage comorbid disease process. What you have to know here is that market level transparency and competition is going to be used through data sharing when we are referred the management of acute medical episodes for ENT, acute surgical episodes, elective episodes, and then the end of life care, where we're uh, participating in, for example, cancer care management. And we're going to be held accountable, and the measurements that we're going to be involved in are called episodes, whether it'll be a procedural episode or a conditioned episode. A procedural episode is a thyroidectomy. A conditioned episode is chronic sinusitis. And so how we manage that process is going to be able to be measured and reported. 
so in terms of the, the performance measurements, what I want to show on this slide is this is from 2022, and CMS has pretty much said this. We need to collect the data to inform referrals to our primary care colleagues. The problem here is no one's working on getting data to the specialists. So we're going to have to begin to get our hands on that data so we can understand the rules. And once we understand the rules, we can get involved in the game. This is from the employer side. Blue Book is a company that provides cost transparency. It's not really very helpful, though, because when you've already been recommended for a colonoscopy, uh, that's not when you start looking for a doctor. But I want to show here is that not only are they naming where you should go based on cost, they're also paying the employee to follow this recommended pathway. So this has been out there for probably five to seven years. And I just want to make sure you're aware that the employers are also following along these lines. So what we're talking about is value based referrals where you come out of the payer ACO primary care relationship and the referral is sent to the spot to the specialist where there is no infrastructure. We don't have care coordination teams. We don't have pet price transparency. We're just taking care of the patients. And so already as it stands, some specialists are generating ACO savings and some are losing ACO savings. What's well, gonna be clear in the future that if you're costing an ACO money, you're not gonna get a referral. And that's the main change in what's going on here. I'll give you a great example. This is actually a real orthopedic group, single specialty group. This, um, this is Medicare data, and it's the for major lower extremity joint replacement, DRG 469 and 470. And this slide shows the cost of taking care of the same patient population. And so the physicians in the green, one through 13, are performing a lower extremity joint procedure below a total cost of care. Not They're all paid the same for the procedure. It's where did they take that patient for their procedure and what did they do for the post-acute care uh, coordination? And so what I want to point out is within one group practice, you have physicians that have a, over two times the cost for treating the same condition. Now, what's been asked is, well, maybe these are more uh, complicated patients for physicians 23, 24, and 25, and 26? The answer is no. We've looked at the data. It's where they're taking the patient to have the procedure done and what sites of service they're choosing for the post-acute care rehab. That's where the cost differential in. A little bit on the prosthesis utilized, but what we need to know is that this graph is completely reproducible in your department, in my practice, and in CHIP's department. So we need to understand this data so we can figure out how we can level this, because if this stays the way it is, we're not all going to get the referrals. Very quickly, I want to look at site of service var cost variability. And these are just top codes from multiple specialties. And I want to focus on otolaryngology, endoscopic total ethmoidectomy, CPT 31255. Now, this data here is not charges. This is not Medicare. This is private payer allowables to facilities for this specific code. The national average is $2,600. But the key thing that we need to understand is that the maximum and minimum average is a spread of, of $11,000 with the national percentage coming in over $4,000 difference. This is the arbitrage. And when we're referred a patient, we're accountable for these costs within the continuum of care of that patient whenever we are injected into this process through a referral. One more slide here. This is all of sinus codes. And just kind of scan the chart and look at the numbers at the cost variability. The minimum average in an urban center, $785. When you move to the maximum average, it's $11,000. And what I think that's important to note is this does impact access to care when you talk about the patient's ability to pay and be engaged. And I found it interesting when you look at site of service costs, the urban center is $785 for the lowest available cost, but for rural areas, it's higher. Why is that? Well, there's no competition, okay? And the low composition zones are typically the more expensive. So our most vulnerable populations have less access today because of CON rules, and, and, and really barriers to investment in those markets. And so this is the part of what's going to be analyzed and changed in the future. 
real quickly, we are being judged for how we spend. Outcomes matter and the cost of those outcomes matter. So if we just look at chronic sinusitis, I'm going to pick on chronic sinusitis here for a little bit. What are we putting in the nose? Well, it matters. Are we all putting steroid eluting stents, non alert steroid eluting stents? Why are we doing what we're doing? Well, let's look at the cost. There's an average of 250,000 sinus cases performed per year. If you just look at the retail 50% utilization of steroid eluting packs, it's $200 million compared to non eluting packs, which is $45 million. It's important for you to know that the $150 million in extra costs is not coming out of someone else's bucket. It's coming out of otolaryngology's bucket. So as you look at your clinical pathways and deciding how to treat your patient, what strategy creates value? Also with biologics, again, the same thing, difference in cost. Studies showing that sinus surgery treatments over 36 years can cost $50,000 versus biologics costing over a half a million. What's right for each patient? Each patient should not we should have access to full care, but we shouldn't just be rubber stamping what we're doing because we think it works for everybody. Being selective and how we apply these things matter. Lastly, head and neck cancer. This will be where value-based contracts will land. And if you just look at the 30-day admission rate, okay, the cost variability associated with that, and the average cost is about $15,000. How are we preloading our patients? to be able to be prepared for the surgery. We're gonna be accountable for that. And so it's again, taking the time to think through the algorithms, find out how to support the patient, understanding the cost roadmap. We've only got so much money in our pocket and we're about to go on a journey. How do you make it to the end? That's what we need to be aware of. So in talking about value-based care, we need to define value. And if you've read anything about this subject, you have seen some variation of the formulas on the screen where value equals quality over cost. Will and I have spent quite a bit of time with payers in North Carolina uh, and speaking with them about how they understand value. And I will tell you that they understand that denominator very, very well. The problem is the numerator. And when you talk to them, they say, that's not up to us, that's up to you. And so when you think about that, you say, well, how in the world are we reporting the value that we're providing? We've talked about patient reported outcome measures. There's PACES, which is a center in which uh, those types of pathways are collected. Yet we don't have common language amongst otolaryngologists or amongst specialists even in how we define quality when we're delivering care. So we're going to ask you to think about it a little bit differently. Next slide. Our proposal is that value equals the sum of the three that you see on the screen here, the management of the patient's experience, the cost of that experience, and the clinical outcomes from that experience. We'll talk about each in a little more detail. Next slide. So patient journey mapping, there's a complex diagram on that screen that you're not expected to see or be able to, to decipher, but it's to highlight the complexity of episodes of care for patients. And patient journey mapping is a sequence of events, of events that occurs when a patient first seeks care. It encompasses all touch points during that care and the delivery of that care. And it focuses on the steps the patient takes before and after they receive that care. Will brought up an important point earlier in head and neck cancer care that I think is worth reiterating. Uh, if you have a patient that is significantly malnourished that shows up in your clinic with an advanced head and neck cancer, and you don't know who's going to help provide care for that patient afterwards, that planning needs to occur at that point in time. That's how value is defined. When they're sitting in a hospital bed post-op and that process begins, that's the most expensive place that they can be located while all of that process is being figured out. Yet in many cases, that's the way we currently deliver care is we take care of the cancer as we should, but in some cases don't think about all of the social factors that go into why that patient developed that, that disease process and how they're gonna be helped in the post-operative period, that post-acute care period where that care delivery is gonna occur. And that brings up health literacy and social determinants of care. There was an interesting study in the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement that was published in 2017 that looked at what goes into a patient's health. And they, through a number of iterations, were able to determine that socioeconomic factors accounted for 40% of that care, 
the physical environment the patient lived in, 10% of what that outcome of care would be, their health behaviors such as smoking, the diet that they have, 30%, and the healthcare itself only 20%, which meant that the, what we did had about a 20% out impact on the outcome of the patient if you were not accounting at all for those other factors that I just described. So understanding those and how those are managed on the front end and on the back end is incredibly important in determining the value of care that we provide to that patient. Next slide. Patient reported experience measures, whether we like it or not, they're here and they're more, like, more than likely here to stay because they provide some degree of objective data that's on the patient end. This is where the patient has some degree of power, those press gainy, again, whether or not those questions are appropriate to determine how a physician should be ranked, are numbers that are data that the insurance company can use to determine who's providing value and the health system potentially can use to drive care and determine who's providing value. So how do we have an effect on those, those and what those questions are that are being asked? Next slide. And certainly we've got to be able to bring our best version of ourselves to work every day. That's hard to do. We got a lot of stuff going on in our lives. COVID had a significant impact on all of us. Uh, we're tired, burnout. Burnout was popular before COVID came around and it's certainly been highlighted more after the challenges that we've had in delivering care during a really challenging time in our country. So, you know, as we come together and think about what we need to do to move forward and provide value, we got to take care of ourselves first. And if you're not in an environment where you can do that, you're not going to be able to succeed in any of the other things that we've talked about today. Next slide. So certainly, as I mentioned in the, in the historic equation of, of value equals quality over cost, the cost being the denominator, controlling that is something that we should be empowered to do in, in our current delivery mod, care model, have a hard time doing. Price transparency listed at the bottom there, you know, in what sort of an environment in today's society can you can somebody come to us as an educated individual and ask us, what does this cost? And you can't answer that question. I mean, that is an unreasonable place to be in 2023. And moving forward, we ought to know what it costs to deliver care. And this goes back to Will's site of service. So site of service management is incredibly important. Uh, as an academician practicing in a complex healthcare system with a number of areas where I can deliver care, uh, it, it's important where I deliver care and who I deliver that care to in that environment with respect to cost. And what I mean by that is if you're listening to this and it just so happens that your block time is in, is in an HOPD environment, which is hospital outpatient department or otherwise care in a hospital setting. So you've got block time in your, you know, in your main hospital OR and you're doing anesthesia level ASA1 and ASA2 outpatient cases in that environment, you're incredibly expensive to the payer to deliver that care. And while a uh, academic medical center can care for the entire spectrum of a disease process, the reality is in most academic centers, the majority, and you can figure out what percentage that is, the majority of care that we provide could be provided in a private practice based setting at a much lower cost. And so this is really important to payers. Again, if cost is in the denominator of that traditional equation, that's driving a lot at the payer level uh, as to what the perception of value is or the reality of value is when it comes to healthcare delivery. And then we need to have a better way of understanding disease severity. So accounting for that on the front end, and that is with specific coding that needs to occur so that all of the patient's comorbidities are appropriately identified. And when care delivery occurs, it's understood at the payer level that that care is going to cost more money and should cost more money. Next slide. Outcomes reporting. We, we've talked about this a little bit more and Will's got another slide coming up on this, but it, it's really important as we define quality that those measures are objective in nature and reproducible across other health systems so that we're all speaking the same language. And patient reported outcome measures, while initially, initially they were intended as a research tool, can certainly be a great pathway in which we report back to payers what our outcomes look like. Next slide. Okay, so we're in the home stretch here. So we've thrown a lot at you. And so it's now to kind of the time to pull all this together. So we're going to be preparing for value based payments. And what we need to do is we need to look at our payer contracts or your payer contracts 
uh, in terms of the patient population. And you would begin to think as a department uh, uh, how you identify where and how you can have an impact within this process that's already in motion. We need to identify where and how you interact and supplement and enhance the care that you're being provided. Uh, are there specifics that only we have that we can adequately address? Are we going to need to collaborate with other individuals? Understand that in this process, how you partner in this will determine whether you win or lose. And we need to see uh, what is, is happening and what can happen through other perspectives. So this is something that's new to us, but it's already happening in other specialties. So we need to be collaborating more with those who are already involved in this. This is not an otolaryngology only process. So there are other surgeons and medical specialists that we need to be collaborating with. Um, understand that payers and employers want to limit utilization, and they want to do that through what's called an analysis of appropriate appropriateness of care. When their volume spikes, they're, they're going to attract attention because at this point they want to know what are we getting out of this volume? and make sure that you are correctly placing that care at the right side of service. Now, when we talk to general surgeons, they point out, well, we don't have an ambulatory care center. You know, we're stuck in the hospital. That's correct. And guess what? Within a hospital setting, there's multiple sites of service. An ICU, a step-down unit, a routine floor, and then rehab facilities. Those are your sites of service. And of course, your goal is to get them out the exit door and into their home because the longer they stay in the hospital, the more they're spending. They need to be there when they need to be there. This is not about denial of care, but assessing why we're keeping them where we are and having the clinical protocols to be able to assess and monitor the outcomes that are guiding our decisions. You need to discern, determine the feasibility and the processes necessary to measure your impact. And this gets into outcomes measures for otolaryngology. We need to relook at those because outcomes were not, this was kind of a surprise when someone who was an outcomes expert told me this, but outcomes measures were never meant to be used in clinical practice. They were for research tools. So they were never looked at how many questions in a survey or how many questions that in terms of the patient's interaction are required before you start getting a tremendous reduction in response rates. The surveys that we have were meant to prove that what we're doing actually produces an outcome. Now we need to take those same models and adapt them to being functionally applicable within the general population in order to achieve data flow that can continue to monitor that. So we've given this about 20 times to grant to academic departments. And the reason why we're doing academic departments is that you all are our leaders in otolaryngology at every level of the way. You're in a health system. And what has been asked of us is, well, what are we supposed to do right now? Well, let's leave this presentation with a punch list for things you can do beginning today to begin your journey through engaging this process. You need to start with asking your administration for data. They have data. They have total cost of care claims data. Um, and by getting this data, you can figure out, well, well what, what data source are we acting for? You, you have claims data, EHR data, clinical and cost data. Begin to figure out what this data means and how to interpret it. Um, you need to understand that data is raw. It may not be grouped in a way that produces a, a, an ability for you to understand and even see the impact. Um, so we've got to look at it from the standpoint of overall cost, side of service, and then understanding these episodes. I'll get to that in a minute. That is the key thing. We're not reinventing the rules. We're going to be applying the rules that have already been built. So look at what you do from a broader perspective. Uh, when does your area uh, focus intersect with other physicians and providers? Because it's not just you, it's the pathologist, the anesthesiologist, the intensivist, and other consultants that you bring into the care of the patient. How do you handle the passing of the care baton? Who's re responsible for each step? Well, if you've initiated it, you're going to be responsible. Um, we need to also understand the 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 non-ENT components, the comorbidities, such as depression and where they live, uh, the, those, those 
factors that impact the social determinants and impact how that patient will perform within your treatment plan. So again, engage other specialists that are involved in value-based care, learn from what they're doing and where they failed and beginning to integrate that into our specialty as we map our journey out. Um, think about what care is appropriate. Um, it's easy to order things, but is it appropriate within that setting? A lot of times you may order things because it's convenient for you to get the care completed. Well, then what infrastructure do you need to help monitor those processes and produce alternate pathways that cost less? Um, ask which clinical and quality measures impact patient care and what would uh, appropriately reflect in your performance. How would you want to be judged by the referring physician? The rules for judging otolaryngologists have not been written. We need to begin writing those because if we don't write those, somebody else will, and then we'll be all judged by that. My final slide here um, is really in terms of what is an episode of care. Um, you don't have to worry about defining that. It's already been defined for us. And if you look at PACES, which is an open source process that probably will become the defining source for episodes of care, we already have 90 acute, chronic, and procedural episodes defined. Now, these are trigger codes because you don't know what something costs if you don't know what codes to include in the analysis of that total cost of care. So within Regent, which is clinical patient registry that we built to engage with MACRA, MIPS, and MVP, we need to make sure that we're collecting the data that helps integrate with the um, building out of new episodes of care through PACES, inter interacting and engaging the current episodes of care, and within otolaryngology, how do we own our episodes? And so I'm having discussions with the American College of Surgeons who are integrated in uh, and a part of the uh, uh, the, the PACES uh, episode system. And we're developing a process where otolaryngology can own and maintain its own episodes bring in urology to do the same as in ophthalmology and other specialties. The more we're responsible for, the more we should own the definition of if this process is going to have a meaningful impact in terms of our role and what we can do to deliver that impact. So this is the final slide. It's the most complicated slide. It's not meant to even be looked at today. We will send copies of our PowerPoint presentation our goal is to give information to you all to get you to be thinking. And so when you're engaging this process, we presented a three-dimensional model to redefine value because we wanted to provide you a punch list of how to begin to target and engage this process. <clears throat> and importantly, within our clinical peer review papers that we're publishing, we should begin to integrate these concepts into that. Try to pull value-based concepts into what we're producing within our literature. And then the box on the right shows the episode grouper process for defining and understanding uh, these episode models. And again, otolaryngology, we're finding a pathway for us to be involved in that process. So that concludes our presentation. I'm sorry that Jim Guerra was not able to join us today, um, but this is the message we're sending and uh, we'll take it uh, questions and answers at this point. Are there any questions? Well, while people are, are thinking, I wanted to say this was an excellent presentation. Um, it's a little concerning because it demonstrates that we have a long way to go. Do um, is besides um, looking at the data, are there any other type of communities on the local level or national level that we should try to get on and help define quality. I'm pretty concerned that, you know, it's good to have to pay in defining what quality is at this point. So you were kind of coming in and out there. We had some background noise, but I think I got the gist of the question. So here's the issue, Troy, is that all of our committee structure 
uh, has been defined and built by fee for service. So we do have quality committees at the academy, uh, outcomes committee at the academy, but they're really not thinking through it through this prism. So we need to go to these existing committees uh, and get them to think about an entirely different way of utilizing their role in, in managing that aspect of, of otolaryngology. And we are going to have to make new committees. We're, we're proposing a PACES committee that can begin to uh, send out uh, uh, subspecialty specific questions and have the subspecialty components of our uh, otolaryngologists uh, begin to take control of that. So uh, at the local level, what Chip and I have done within the Otolaryngology Health Policy Advisory Committee is get involved in payer clinical medical policies. And as we review those, making sure that we're beginning to inject these processes. So the answer to your question is the infrastructure has not been built. There are components that can be retooled. And now is the time to be thinking and asking those exact questions and doing it in a very organized fashion. We do have time, but we need to use our time efficiently. Patrick. Hey, can you guys hear me OK? Yeah. Yep. And, and just for everybody on the call, somebody may need to mute their phone. There's a lot of uh, background noise that uh, me, that we're all getting. Uh, first of all, thank you guys very much for a great uh, talk. Uh, I have a couple of um, sort of uh, comments that maybe I could get your your feedback and advice on for us. Uh, and uh, some of this is also for everybody on the call just to kind of uh, be aware in case um, some of the opportunities we have here aren't as clear as they could be. Uh, the the first is that, you know, there is there's very little consensus amongst academic healthcare leaders uh as to the degree to which we should be focusing on this um i think everything you said is right i think this you know if you if you define value-based care as you know reimbursements that have measures attached to it there has been this creep over the past 10 15 years uh, much of which you've described towards more and more value-based care uh, arrangements uh subsidizing health care you know and and uh, CMS has its targets for 2030. It seems like something we should absolutely be focusing on. Um, and uh, but it it's not uh, the top priority in most centers, which is kind of fascinating. I'm sure that um, fascinates and maybe uh, bedevils you guys. Um, we have here a couple of advantages where I think at Cleveland Clinic, we we may be uniquely positioned. I don't know if this is certainly the case, but it seems to me we may be uniquely positioned to really commit. Uh, the first is we have this history. So for everybody on the call, the formation of the Institute structure was very much informed by Michael Porter's work and what he calls integrated patient units. Uh, organizing care around specific conditions with the hope that would lead to better outcomes. And I think implicit in it was also lower costs. Um, so we do have that in our DNA. And in fact, Cleveland Clinic has an extremely sophisticated uh, time-driven activity-based cost accounting system. Um, one that uh, our finance folks claims is as sophisticated as any in the United States. In fact, they've engaged with Michael Porter himself about why they think our model here uh, is better than what he proposes. You know, we just don't really use it. The institutes don't use it. it it's a it's a structure that exists, though. It's a, a capability we have. And as we're going through this dramatic remodel now of our organization, um, we are discussing how we can um, take advantage of that capability. The the focus is really for us to understand profitability more just for the health of the enterprise. Uh, but it's obviously an opportunity for value-based care positioning uh, as well. Uh, the second is, as everybody on the call knows, we've invested over the past two years in a process where we've uh, had every single subspecialty within otolaryngology in our department identify a condition or procedure, at least one each, which we now have uh, objective outcomes measures built into Epic through smart forms for op notes uh, that should be now an automated process. We've just kicked it off over the past several months and patient reported outcomes, at least one validated measure for every single subspecialty, at least one condition or procedure that we're sending out to every single patient. 
We're doing that and we prompted that process over the past two years through an IRB in part because we think it's the right thing to do to develop a continuous improvement culture. But to be clear to everybody on the call, it's also because I personally believe that this is the future. And if we don't start driving our capabilities in this way, we're going to be left behind. Uh, and the, you know, my next comment, and maybe you got you guys can give it maybe some advice to us as we're trying to develop in these ways is when it comes to the outcomes measures, we've done a dive. Dr. Shaban and George Opolis and I have uh, have met with the folks from Regent, you know, the, the database registry we have. And um, certainly it does not, uh, in, as far as I can tell, reflect Porter's vision for value based care uh, being measures that matter to our patients. You know, and that's part of why we're, you know, pursuing this process ourselves. But it's, it's going to be a real lift because there isn't a national registry that I'm aware of, at least, you know, for voice outcomes after, you know, speech surgery or hearing outcomes after cochlear implantation. And that just may be a blind spot for us. So I'd welcome any uh, perspectives you have and advice. And I also just want everybody on the call to know that this is something that we've been pursuing for all these reasons. And thank you so much for such a great talk. So I wrote down the punch list here. We're going to give you some good answers. And one of the things I'm going to do is run through my thoughts and then I want Chip to chip to uh, chip in uh, because he's at Duke, and I think that it's important for institutions to talk about their different strategies. And he's on the value-based care transition committee, and so let's talk about well, why is it is this a priority? Well, let's talk about how CMS defines priority. CMS, when they went to try to change how hospital systems were paid, the DRG system, they did a test model in New Jersey. The test model worked and they immediately rolled it out across the country. Within that 24 month period, hospitals were destabilized and 24% almost became non-viable. That's how Medicare rolls out pro programs. They only care about the Medicare beneficiary. They don't care about how you do it. They only care about the trust fund and the beneficiary. They're gonna lay down the rules and we adapt. And I also think it's important to know, well, this has been talked about for years. Should this be a priority for us? Well, let's give another example. EMR. EMR was talked about for 30 years. Why do we have EMR? Because Medicare said you're going to have EMR or you're just not going to get paid the same. And that's why EMR came crashing into our world so fast. Value-based care is the next train car. And when CMS says go, we're going to go. The reason why it's not a priority is that fee for service is so hard to separate from. So Medicare is going to make that easier for us. OK, and that's why pay cuts keep going. They're already going to be cutting Medicare Advantage pay cuts to the payers. That is the most profitable insurance product that payers have. And one of the reasons why one payer is being very aggressive in the market is they're going to lose 25 percent of their revenue. CMS has said we're not paying that. And so. We're going to find this quiet little thing in the background is like playing with a snake in the brush. It's going to be what determines which direction we walk. OK, and so um, on that, I'm going to let Chip kind of describe uh, between institutions. How are they approaching this and what lessons can you all share between each other about how to approach this process, Chip? Yeah, first I'd say kudos to you, Patrick, and your team at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I think you probably have the most well-developed process that I've heard in all of our academic grand rounds presentations to date. So you may be doing things better than what we're doing, certainly here at Duke and what I've heard from other institutions. But the, the, the first piece of this is a connection with an administrative team within the health system that has an interest in this. Because the reality is day to day, we as clinicians don't have the bandwidth or ability to move the needle without the help from administration and understanding what our costs are. So what I would recommend that you do sort of the next steps is to charge each of your division chiefs with looking at what your top one, two, and three CPT codes are for each of the um, each, each of the professors in those divisions and look at the difference in cost of care for those uh, conditions. And I'm not talking about the professional fees. As folks on the call understand, you know, when a charge is submitted to insurance for care we provide, you basically have three costs if it's an operative service. You've got the facility fee, the anesthesia fee, and the physician fee. And that pro fee is pretty much the same across 
all care environments you provided other, other than perhaps a clinic-based setting where you've got the difference between a non-facility and a facility. But that notwithstanding, the facility fee is what you need to be looking at. You know, if a procedure in total costs ten thousand dollars and you get a grand for your professional fee and it costs a grand for anesthesia and it's eight grand for the facility fee in one sort of environment for that top CPT code, and then in another environment that facility fees two thousand dollars, you need to understand where you want to drive care. So if the majority of your group practices in an HOPD environment, you are, that is a certainly a very big blind spot that needs to be managed. Because at the end of the day, the collections that occur for you at a departmental level that come in as receipts and revenue for the professional fees or services you provide are essentially going to be the same. It's really that facility management is where we need to start. And then Secondarily, the charge should be an expansion of what you just talked about with the patient reported outcome measures, looking at paces and seeing, okay, in episodes of care, do we have some data that we can collect for each of those subject matters that we can potentially report out? Because that's what insurance companies are going to be asking for. As Will pointed out, the key, I know, I know we're running late on, we're running, uh, running on time here, but the, the key point in that is in the future environment, if this train comes, as Will just mentioned, the real result of people not participating on the front end is you will stop getting referrals. And that is it, period, end of discussion, because you cost too much money. And if the patient wants to go there, that's fine. That's where coinsurance and out-of-network comes into play. And so now the patient bears a significant aspect of that cost to be able to continue to have care in the center where they want to receive it. So that, that's sort of where we're headed, and I hope, I hope that's helpful. Last quick thought. If sure we have the discipline to get involved on our own, somebody else is going to make these rules. And then the last point is, where do you focus in otolaryngology? You focus in the areas that have the highest spend variability. That's the arbitrage. You don't focus on things that don't have much cost. Tonsillectomy, okay, that's easy. Just you focus on your cost. And the very last thing is it takes years to build out the infrastructure. As a department of otolaryngology, you need to think about yourself. Is your institution providing the cost um, uh, appropriate side of service? You do need to have ambulatory surgery access, and that takes years to build out. And you all should be in the discussions because as you indicated, Patrick, the administrative side, they're not going to want to move out of the high payout um, options. But I will say that Cleveland Clinic, like everybody else, has Medicare Advantage contracts, so they do care about the spend, and, and you do make money when you do things appropriately within those rules. Yeah, you know, and just again, a comment that each of these points are so well taken, and I'm taking notes here. Um, for those on the call, this um, in the background, some of our efforts to decant certain blocks and procedures, which will be an ongoing effort from the main campus into our ASC system, uh, there's a variety of reasons that we're doing that, including expanding our capacity for complex cases on main campus. But in the background, in my mind, another reason is we're trying to position ourselves to win at the value-based game down the future. And because it's not a top priority at the, the very high level, level, highest levels here, I feel like we just have to drive what we can uh, independently as best we can. Well, thank you um, both for excellent presentation and also providing practical ways that, you know, we can uh, start to implement this value based care in our practices. Um, this concludes our grand rounds for today. Um, really appreciate you joining. Thank you. Thank you for letting us time. Appreciate it.